can say something from mass media. Is it eight? Um, do you like your orange oh. thing? Why did those pickles? Oh. You picked up a prickly pear. Uh -huh. You can spare fingers. We might get started. Um, all right, Ahlan was Ahlan. Um, I would like to welcome you all to this panel discussion tonight and particularly welcome our panelists, Nadia Daka and Yusuf Al-Rimawi um, and also Basim Tamimi, who I think is running just a tiny bit late. So hopefully he'll join us soon. Um, I wanna first start by acknowledging that many of us are meeting on stolen Aboriginal land. I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri land and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I also pay my respects to the elders of the lands of the various First Nations where you are all on and acknowledge that all of the First Nations people joining us here today. I think it bears acknowledging that we're about to have a discussion of prison and the Palestinian reality um, of prison from a country where Indigenous peoples are quite literally the most incarcerated people on earth. I just checked today and in the Northern Territory, currently 94% of the youth in custody or 48 out of 51 of the youth in detention are Aboriginal. In Victoria, in Victoria where we are um, today, still the rates um, at which in Indigenous youth are incarcerated are eight times that of non-Indigenous youth. I wonder what that rate would be for the non-Indigenous white youth while Aboriginal deaths in custody in this country are an absolute national shame. The reason I think it's important to start this panel by situating this discussion in, in the land and the reality here is because we can then look to Palestine and the apartheid reality that is Israel and look at it not as an aberration, somehow removed from all other contexts, but more as a connected struggle from which we understand and act. Um, that there is almost not a family in Palestine untouched by prison reflects a reality here for First Nations people. At the same time, that, that understanding can go both ways. So that in also recognizing the settler colonial history and the reality of our country, and that, is in, that it is in both the similarities and the differences that we can help reflect an understanding of what Israel is and may be trying to achieve. So I think that's an important acknowledgement to, to start with at this discussion, this discussion tonight. So I'm your facilitator um, tonight. My name is Melissa. I'm a human rights lawyer and activist. Um, I've lived, worked and loved in Palestine. And I'm one of many organizers with Free Palestine Melbourne. There are many behind the scenes tonight who've made this event possible. And I wanna acknowledge their involvement tonight. We also do welcome others joining us and becoming a part of Free Palestine Melbourne. Um, we meet monthly on the second Saturday of the month. If you'd like to get involved, just send us an email or reach out on social media. We'd be very happy to share the Zoom links for our current meetings. And when we're back in person, we'll be at the Kathleen Syme Library on the second Saturday of every month. Um, I think going into the chat now should be some details around us. We also have a monthly newsletter 
Um, we're available on most platforms, social, uh, social media platforms. There's a blog on our website. Um, and we also thank all our supporters who generously donate um, so that we can do this work. Um, all of us are volunteers, but it does cost money to put these events together. And so we're eternally grateful to all our supporters that make this organising possible. This brings me to tonight's panel. And I'm very, very proud to welcome our three speakers. I just thought I'd, before I jump into it, check and see, and I can see that Bassam has joined us. Um, so I'm very proud to welcome our um, three speakers, human rights lawyer uh, with Hamoket, uh, Nadia Daka, Palestinian activist and former prisoner, Bassem Tamimi, and Palestinian activist, writer and lecturer, Yusuf Al-Rimawi. Al At the outset of this, I started with an acknowledgement in which I pointed out the parallels between Palestine and First Nations in Australia. I think Palestinians and First, Nation acti First Nations activists here, they are themselves leading the charge to recognise the parallels between these struggles. They are obvious. There is also learning in those differences, differences and it is not to diminish the horrific and the very particular experience that is Palestine. We're now 54 years after the 1967 occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, and Israel has reached the unenviable statistic just a couple of weeks ago of having incarcerated more than a million Palestinians since occupying those lands. They are all prisoners of war. Yet Israel portrays them as, a, as, as criminals, as, as, and I dare I say it, terrorists. It has built a pervasive system of incarceration that extends far beyond the walls of prison. It extends to whole families and communities through the collective punishment and the demolition of prisoners' homes, the denial of human touch and physical connection, the arbitrary nature of arrest and detention, all of this impacts on families, and we're going to hear about this tonight. But it also extends into the leadership and the political organisation of the Palestinian struggle. Israeli prisons are full of the past and present charismatic political, intellectual and artistic leadership of Palestine. The future, as well as the future leadership through the Palestinian act, student activists. Particularly, we see this in the targeting of Palestine's leading university, Birzet, and the students there. And you would be hard pressed to find a family not affected by any of this. It is a system designed to break the soul and the spirit of the Palestinian people and their struggle. That is why when on the 6th of September this year, when six Palestinians broke out of Israel's highest security prison, Gilboa, in a Shawshank Redemption style prison escape, it would seem with almost no plan and little more than a spoon, they became instant heroes and galvanized the imagination of Palestinians. They have inspired songs, sculptures, poetry, discourse, and this discussion. While they've now been recaptured, they've been tortured, and they're, as we speak, in court awaiting their new fate. It is an opportunity for us to discuss that prison escape, what it means, and that it shows that the Palestinian, the Israeli system, no matter how all pervasive, it hasn't broken the will of the Palestinian people and their spirit. And so it's with that that I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Nadia Daka. Nadia has been working as an in-house attorney at Hamoked since 2015. She's been advocating for the rights of Palestinian detainees in the Israeli prison system. Her work includes advocating for adequate conditions of detention for Palestinian detainees, seeking relief and redress for victims of abuse, ill treatment and torture, facilitating prison visits for detainees' relatives and submitting habeas corpus petitions demanding that the Israeli authorities disclose the location of Palestinian detainees. She also recently completed an LLM in um, human rights law and international law and participated in the summer program on human rights law at the European University Institute in Firenze. Um, Nadia, welcome, and I'm going to hand over to you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to participate uh, today with you. Uh, so I don't need to represent myself. Uh, you did it well. <laughs> Um, so uh, I want to talk um, about, uh, so I think that it's very important to do a little introduction before I start to uh, 
to talk uh, about uh, Palestinian prisoners. And I think uh, this is very important to understand the context. So because we are talking about Palestinian prisoners in an international context, I think it is very important to talk about the definition of the prisoners of war and how this definition is not applied by the Israeli system uh, to Palestinian prisoners that, uh, that by definitions are uh, Palestinian of, uh, uh, prisoners of war. Uh, so the third Geneva Convention uh, provides a wide range of protection uh, for prisoners of war. And also IHL protects uh, other persons deprived of uh, IHL international humanitarian law. Uh, uh, provide um, uh, pro or protect other person deprived or, uh, of liberty as a result of armed conflict. Uh, the characteristics of prisoners of war is that, that they cannot be prosecuted for taking a direct part in hostilities. Their detention should, should be not a form of punishment, but only aims to prevent uh, further participation in the conflict. They must be released and repatriated without delay, a delay after the end of the, uh, of the hostility. And in the case of Palestinian uh, prisoners, we are talking about a very long conflict. And this explains the high number of uh, people serving a life sentence, something like uh, 544, uh, and uh, 499 serving a sentence of uh, more than 20 years. Uh, the detaining power also may prosecute them for possible war crimes, but not uh, for acts of violence that are lawful under, uh, under IHL. So it's lawful to uh, resist. And the, the, the fourth Geneva uh, Convention uh, is, uh, decide or regulate the, uh, the, the right to resist or to oppose the occupation. So, all these prisoners, they are not, uh, uh, they are not uh, prosecuted for uh, war crimes, and they, uh, we can say that they do lawful things uh, under the IHL. Uh, prisoners of war also must be treated humanly in all circumstances. They are not, uh, they are protect, uh, protected against any act of violence, as well as against uh, intimidation, insults, public curiosity. Uh, IHL also defines minimum condition of detention, covering such issues as uh, accommodation, food, uh, hygiene, uh, clothing, and medical care. So this is the normative uh, framework in general. Uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, I, now I want to pass to something more interesting. And let's begin with, with number. As of September 2021, Israel holds 4,512 Palestinian as the so-called security inmates, uh, consisting of 2,520 sentenced prisoners, uh, 1,474 remand detainees, 518 administrative detainees held without trial. While imprisonment inherently uh, restricts a person's liberty, prisoners and detainees should retain all their fun fundamental, uh, fundamental rights. But the conditions of security inmates, uh, the so-called security inmates, differ from regu regular inmates. Israel's treatment of security inmates violates their rights to equality, dignity, family life, education, and more, in contravention with the uh, international law. The overwhelming majority of these uh, security inmates are Palestinian from the OPT. Holding them inside Israel constitutes a blatant violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention, prohibiting the transfer of prisoners outside the occupied territory. Another serious violation is the violation of the obligation to give a notification of a person's arrest and place of detention. Every year, Israeli military uh, arrests thousands of Palestinians of, uh, without notifying the families of the detention and the place of detention, and not even providing an official uh, contact point for these families to make direct inquiries about their loved ones. Detainees' rights, in general, among them the right uh, to due process, including the right to regular representation, the right to adequate uh, holding conditions, the right not to be subjected to torture or in human uh, or in human conditions, uh, the right not to be subjected to torture, uh, uh, 
sorry, the right to family visit, all of them are among the most uh, well established of human rights. Uh, but the primary condition for the realization is that the place wherein the detainee is uh, being held will be known. Allowing his lawyers and relatives to visit him, appraise the treatment he received, and uh, act for the re realization of his rights. Beyond that, I think that the knowledge of a person's uh, place of detention has deep emotional value to his family, making the right to notification a, ba a basic right of the, both the detainee and his family. In almost all cases, the only way families can get information is through us, is, is through us, organization or other lawyers. Sometimes we are forced to submit petitions to, for writ of habeas corpus to, com uh, to compel the state to disclose uh, the whereabouts of the detainee. And by the way, the kind of uh, petition uh, this, of this petition led us to, to the exposure of the secret prison, uh, facility 1391, where in, uh, during the second intifada um, were held hundreds of Palestinians without knowing where, where they were. And I want to share with you a, a case that can demonstrate the seriousness of this kind of violation. The case of M.A., a 16-year-old Palestinian uh, Yas who arrived at Etzion uh, police station after he was summoned for interrogation. The Yas was injured in his leg and using a uh, crutches. Uh, he was uh, taken out of hospital before the end of his hospitalization period, as demanded by security officials. The family was not told uh, that their son was about to be arrested. And uh, also, there were, uh, they were not notified about uh, uh, the son's whereabouts. The family asked us after uh, many hours to assist in locating the minor. But, the, but what happened that after we uh, asked the military, the military failed to provide any information about him. After he was missed for more than 24 hours, we filed an, an urgent uh, petition for a writ of habeas corpus. In the hearing conducted on the following day, 48 hours after, uh, the, uh, after the disappearance of MA, uh, the state admitted that they still don't know where, uh, where he is held. After many days, we, re we revealed that uh, MA was interrogated for five hours at the police station by four interrogators of the Israeli security agency. The interrogators beat, beat him and threatened him and refused to uh, provide medical treatment to this boy. And needless to say the, uh, that he was not allow allowed to confer with counsel. After the interrogation, soldiers transported him to a nearby uh, military base where he was kept for over 24 hours in a kitchen with his hands uh, tied af uh, after his uh, back, behind his back. And at night he slept with, with the blind blindfolded eyes on the exposed uh, kitchen floor. Despite his request, the soldiers give him no food and only twice give some water to drink. On the second night, the medical condition uh, growing worse and he was taken to hospital. And after that, again, to another military base where he was kept handcuffed, sitting on a chair this time. Only 60 hours after his arrest, M.A. was brought before, for the first time before a military judge. Only then he was given a meal. Only then his family was informed of his whereabouts. It's an horrible case. Uh, and uh, talking about how uh, this case um, illustrate the torture of a, girl, of a boy, uh, I want to talk about torture. Uh, I think that uh, the major part of us know uh, that the right not to be subjected to, to torture is an absolute right, and international law make no exception to the absolute prohibition to torture. Since 1948, and uh, much more since, uh, uh, since the occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, Israeli security forces have been torturing and ill-treating Palestinians every year using cruel physical and mental methods in order to extract information and confessions. For years and this day, ISA, Israeli security agency interrogators, 
have been using a combination of torture techniques, among them uh, skype techniques composed of painful and contorted uh, shaking, uh, hooding with a wet, full smelling sack and exposure to loud music, continued for hours or days at a time, for standing or crouching in, co in contorted positions to the point of physical collapse, beating and violent shaking, sleep and food deprivation, prolonged exposure to extreme temp uh, temperatures, harsh lightning or complete darkness, uh, treats verbal, uh, verbal abuse, use of family members as a mean of pressure, a prolonged total denial of contact with the outside world, including attorney and family. And I have a lot to talk about uh, torture, but I want to uh, pass to the other topic. And I think it's another way how to torture prisoners from another perspective. It's family visits. Uh, Israel allows only first degree relatives to visit their uh, loved ones in prison. Uh, even that is subject to the permit issues and only as a part or, of the scheduled visit days on which the ICRC, the Red Cross, organizes trans transportation. After getting a permit, still no one of the family uh, uh, of the family members knows whether they will actually make the visit uh, until they reach the checkpoint. A soldier there uh, sometimes do not uh, let, them, uh, let them through, and they are forced to return home without visiting their loved ones. If they manage to pass the checkpoint and arrive at the prison, the visit itself lasts only 45 minutes, during which the family members talk to their loved ones through a phone receiver from behind a glass uh, screen. After the visit, the, the family member usually, usually gets home in the evening after an exhausting day, just for a meeting of 45 minutes. During this visit, children are not allowed in general to have physical contact with their loved one in prison. Prisoners also are not allowed to, to attend funerals of uh, their loved one, loved one. And maybe you hear recently about the case of Khalida Jarrar, that her daughter died suddenly of heart attack uh, while the mother was in jail. And she was told she will not be left let out for seeing her daughter on her final journey. Uh, prisoners also, in that case, they just give her a uh, one call to her family. In general, they uh, don't call uh, their families, uh, are not allowed to call their families. And this explains why, uh, why last year, uh, uh, with the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic, Thousands of Palestinian prisoners were kept uh, entirely without contact uh, with the outside world. And this, is, uh, this was the result of the persistent refusal of Israel to allow uh, to call their families by telephone, uh, although prison visits have been suspended. And at that time, we had to file a petition demanding phone calls for all Palestinian prisoners uh, or the so-called security inmates, the state committed to only granting uh, minors a 10 minute long telephone call once every two weeks, so long as visits are unavailable. Uh, for adults, we managed to get just one call during uh, Ramadan. Uh, and now I want to pass just to uh, the last uh, topic and I think is the most in interesting one, administrative detention. Uh, so, Israel, as I say, Israel currently holds thousands of uh, Palestinians in its prison. Most of, the, most of them have been convicted in court, uh, convicted, sorry, in court, but hundreds of them, uh, as I showed before, uh, have been held for months or years uh, under administrative orders without being tried. Administrative detainees are denied rights to which defendants uh, in criminal proceedings are entitled. Criminal defendants uh, are detained for purposes of interrogation and then released or are prosecuted for acts they are suspected uh, uh, of having committed. Uh, administrative detention, on the other hand, is intended to, to, is, is intended to thwart a prospective danger. 
administrative detainees are not told the reason for their detention and not know the evidence uh, uh, there is against them. Consequently, they cannot try to refute it, to cross-examine the witnesses, or to present contradictory uh, evidence. I like, unlike prisoners who have been sentenced to a specific jail term, after which they are supposed to be released, administrative detainees do not know uh, when they go, will go free, and there is no restriction on the length of uh, the time they may be held. Every year we send uh, to the IPS a request, a request under the Freedom of Information Law for data concerning administrative detainees held uh, by Israel, and I want to show you uh, the, uh, what we get in the last time we get answered. Uh, it was on March 2020, at that date, Israel held 431 adult Palestinian men in security administrative detention. Of, the, of them, 169 have been detained for a period up to six months, 159 for a period of six months to a year, 100 for a period of a year to two years, three for over than two years, and it is important to note that the administrative detention of any one of these detainees may have been extended after that. According to, the, to that response, at, the, at that time, four women were held in administrative detention also, two of, uh, two of them uh, for a period of uh, up to six months, and two for a period of a year to two years. Additionally, there were two man, minors boys uh, for, uh, uh, for a period up to six months. It is also important to note that uh, it is likely that some of these detainees were administratively detained in the past for periods uh, for long term that are not included in this data that was provided by the IPS. Thank you, um, Nadia. You, Nadia. I think my, I'm not getting an echo now. Thank you so much for that um, discussion. You've covered a lot of information for us in a very short period of time. Um, I might just ask you one quick question before we move on to Bassem. Um, when we talk about these things, and, and everyone that you've talked about, they're all prisoners um, and from the West Bank and from Gaza and from um, Jerusalem. I wonder if you might speak to, uh, and they're prisoners of war and they're clearly bound by the, the Geneva Conventions, but I wonder if you might speak to the experience now that we're moving into a conversation around apartheid Israel, um, the experience of Palestinians with Israeli citizenship um, in the prison system. Um, so uh, I have to say that in, in our organization where I work, we don't represent Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, but I can say that they are uh, held in the same conditions. Uh, maybe in the case of their families, uh, it's easier to visit because they don't need a military permit. But on the other hand, in their case, it is more difficult to include them in prisoner in prisoners exchange uh, agreement because the Israel claim that uh, they are uh, the citizens and uh, their citizens, and this is an internal Israeli issue. And this explains why the major part of these groups stay in jail for decades. Uh, and I can share with you that, um, for example, my uncle is one of these prisoners. Uh, he was arrested on March 1986 and was convicted for a life sentence. Uh, I was born a year later. And I didn't meet, I managed to meet him for the first time just uh, when I became a lawyer on December uh, 2013. And I hope to see him free soon. Wow, yeah, I mean, that's as long as I've been alive as well. Um, that's, um, I'm, I mean, as I said in the introduction, there aren't people that aren't affected by this and I'm so sorry. Um, Wow. I might, um, I have many more questions for you, but maybe they'll come out in the discussion. I might move on to um, Bassem now um, and uh, welcome him to the, to the panel now. I've got him coming up. So, um, hello, Bassem, Kifalak. Hello, hello, Helene, hello. <laughs> um, so Salaam I just might... <laughs> 
Wa alaikum wasalam. Um, I might just introduce you and then I'll, I'll give you the platform. Um, so for, for our audience, Basim Tamimi is an activist and human rights defender, and he's the leader of the Nabi Saleh Popular Struggle Committee um, near Ramallah, um, which is a non-violent group that protests um, against Israel's ongoing occupation of the Palestinian territory through you know, daily, weekly, peaceful demonstrations in their village in Nabi Saleh. Um, Amnesty International has referred to Basim as a prisoner of conscience. Um, he has been, unfortunately, um, arrested many times uh, and experienced what it is to be a prisoner in Israel's system. And so, too, have his wife and his children. And many of you may have heard of his daughter, Ahed, who was um, incarcerated a couple of years back for slapping a, an Israeli soldier following um, the Israeli shooting her cousin um, just hours earlier. Um, so I'm, with that, I might hand over to Basim to share with us um, his thoughts on, on the prison system. Hello. Hello. Oh. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk and uh, share you my, my story as an example of the, the the meaning on the daily life and the, the meaning on the emotion of everyone who who face the Israeli uh, prisoner system, uh, which uh, and, uh, include every type of, 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 of uh, and way of uh, detain and uh, punish the Palestinian. Uh, my first arrested 1988, uh, administrative arrested. In the day that they declare the the the, uh, the policy of breaking out the, the the bones of the Palestinians activists, it's in the first intifada, and when they arrest me, they start you know, a very violent uh, punishment and uh, beating uh, by their. Uh, by force every place in our body. My friend, they focus on his leg and he has 18, they, they, they demolished his leg. It's 18, broken, they broken it 18 times. Uh, and for the administrative arrest, my first experience in, uh, during the once or once in one day, and it was there we can't, uh, we haven't any visit, we haven't anything in, in the prison in the first intifada. Uh, they put us, uh, us in a tent in Kitsiot or Naqab desert without any uh, needed and wanted that we can live a normal life without food, uh, without water, without, uh, and it's a bad condition. Once they uh, told me I am free and other prisoners, we, they took us from the section that we are there and they give us our thing, our clothes, and then they put us in the bus and they took us around the desert for two hours and then they back to the prison. That's that I mean, to, they want to harm our emotion and to, to broke our, our spirit that we can't continue our life normally in the prison. And then they continue arresting me in administrative arrested. And the worst arrest for me, which was uh, 1993, they, uh, they arrested me and they uh, took me to the interrogation uh, center uh, in Ramallah by the Shabak. And they start, you know, uh, torturing me very psychologically and physically in violent way that they use that the way that shaking my head all the time it's part of the of one of the hardest and dangerous way of torturing the people and it's used for the yani, mm. uh, a serious and uh, dangerous uh, issue uh, 
uh, they start in that round, they tortured me, they, يعني, after days on isolated in a small cell, and uh, they uh, handcuffed and legged cuffed me. They, uh, they also tied us on, uh, on the wall in the way that you can't stand up or you can't sit. And uh, your uh, back and your leg gets a very hard way when you are tied uh, back to the to your uh, to your back your, and you tied on the wall without you can't stand up or you can't sit down and a lot of prisoners has a, a very um, a, any more problem in their back uh, in that time they start torturing me and in very violent way they ask me if i have a relation with killing one of the settler in ramallah and uh, in that time, after hours and hours of torturing me, making my head all the time like this, and all the time by this way or this way, or another ways of, of, of torturing, after hours of uh, they, he hold me like this and shooking me and I feel dizzy. I don't know what's happened. I wake up, I find myself, in a uh, hospital with uh, paralyzed, my half of my body is died uh, or weak. Uh, my head is like this, it's 30, uh, 36 stitch in my head. It's open like this with a lot of blood, a lot of uh, I don't know what I was touched by by my, my hand to see what's happened. I uh, see myself also surrounded by soldiers. They show me a, a newspaper with my, my photo on the newspaper and said that he is the, the person who are responsible for killing a settler. And I see the date. I don't know that. Uh, when I see that it, I don't know if it's the same day or the newspaper of the same day or the day before. And I see that 10 days, I don't know what's happened. I was in coma for 10 days. Nothing I know, just I woke up by late by myself in this, in this hard situation. In that time, they call my, my family and said, I, I have a brain death. And uh, to wait for my body, this is I mean, waiting for, for the... After that, and I start waking up, they, the officer come to me and told me that I must I mean, confess myself and said that I know about the killing of this settler after it's happened with my friend. I told him that I don't know. He told me that you might, I will talk you to al Muscovy. al Muscovy is the worst place for interrogation in the system of the, the, the colonizer system for punishing the, the prisoners. And they took me in this situation paralyzed. They start also beating me in the way. And they put me in the cells in the Muscovy. What's happened, they refuse to continue torturing me or interrogating me because they don't, don't want to be responsible for my death. If, because I haven't, uh, my situation is very bad. And then they uh, took me to, uh, to isolate me in the prison on Ramli among a, an Israeli criminal prisoners. They uh, put me in a small cells isolated for, uh, and they continue coming and ask me questions and question me, ask me and another, another, another every day. Uh, but without torturing me, but because my 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 uh, health situation is very bad. Uh, after a month, they release me in the same day that I found they killed my sister. My only sister, she went before I release to the uh, Israeli military court in Ramallah with her 12 years old son to see my another nephew. He has a court, uh, a, 
and uh, in uh, in that place, they the, the soldier want to arrest the twelve years old son. She want to protect him and ask them why and why. There is a lot of satirical around the, the 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 court. They coming to hear the for a hearing, and one of the Israeli. Uh, employee, she a female employee in the court. She's starting beating my sister, and uh, push her down the stairs. She felt in her head, and the day such a soldier, and the settler start beating her until she has a blood in her head, and she has in a brain death for a week. And they release me in the same day. She pass away. I arrive my home paralyzed weekly with uh, my only sister is dying. After that, يعني, my health started يعني, to be okay. And uh, they, I have no relation with the, the, the charge they asked. They asked me to say that I responsible for, for that I was released. This is the situation. Then, uh, uh, the, the life is continuing. I, my health become back. I can walk. I can. Everything is okay. And uh, 2000, uh, after I married and I, my son, uh, 2003, they arresting me in the night for administrative arrested. My small child. This is my their first experience with the jail. They come to visit me in uh, Nakab. Ahad, Wa'ad, and all the three sons. Uh, and in that time, after I finish my punishment or what uh, in jail for five, for six months, they renew it in the same day, the same moment that I must release. I, I, my family was waiting for me to be released. And uh, they come and let, give me the paper that said that I, it's in either in you the charge or the a, a sentence me for another five months, and that's that's the way they they punish the Palestinian as administrative arrested. I see somebody from my friends that they start renew the the, the decision every seventy two hours. For a year, every 72 hours they renew the, and you see how much it's, it's harm his emotion, his family emotion. Somebody face it for years and years, seven years or eight years, or every six months they renew the decision. And that, this is my, my, my personal experience and my family face all of, all of that, 2000, uh, 11 also they arrest me for uh, leading the the the, the Gubiyar Sagar in Nabi Saleh for 14 months. Uh, they refused to let my family visiting me. They, they give me one visit for, for the family. In that time, Ahd come to the prison and ask me, she was يعني, nine years, if she could study law. Uh, she feel that when she study law, maybe she can protect her family, her people. And after that, they, in, in that, that time, when I was in the section, in the jail, in this situation, they bring my son, 14 years old, they arrest him, and they give him, bring him to the same prison. And because he don't speak about himself and he's small and young. Uh, the officer bring him to the, the section and said, we found the stone in his hand and he refused to confess. And uh, they refused to let him come to my section. They give, put him in another one. Uh, for, uh, and after that, they release him and I were released. My wife was arrested five times and see how is the, I faced it to be responsible for the children, uh, small children without their mom. It's uh, very hard يعني, when you are as prisoners, it's easier to be 
the responsible for the life when one of the parents is uh, inside jail. I, I, I face and I know how, how much uh, difficulties my wife faced in the times I was in jail. It's a hard day, a hard way to, to, to deal with the life alone. Uh, and uh, uh, they arrest her for, for many times. One of the times they arrest her, they said that she uh, entered a closed military zone. And uh, this is the first, they put her in jail for five days, but this charge is the first time that they have this charge alone. They all the time they've had entered in uh, uh, closed military zone and uh, beat the soldier or punish or throw stowing stones or like that mm -hmm. as any, uh, a single uh, a charge. It's the first time and they don't know what they to do, they, how they sentence here. And they ask to reread re all the, uh, the cases before. And they said they want seven years to renew because it's not uh, uh, computerized and they must, uh, it's, it's a way of how they dealing. She is after five days and then we don't know what's happened to the, to the case. If it's a stop, if it's not, we don't know. They, you know, the court itself is part of the punishment system mm -hmm. for the Palestinian. It's not a court. It's just to leg legitimize the occupier way of punishing the, 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 the Palestinian. It's a colonization system. For me, the, the, the court is very, it's the same as the settlement, the same as the checkpoint, the same as the military uh, jeep. It's part of the, the Kubayar system. And you know, they arrest my, my, my daughter uh, 2016, and they took her in, to the interrogation system. And you know how it's in, in my, my emotion that I know what's happening there. I face, feel in hard way that what will happen for her, for a small child. And she refused to speak and tell them her name for 16 days. She stopped talking. And this make them crazy because they say, no, they don't want to, they don't need any information from her because in, in, in the video, she slapped the soldiers, but they to, 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 they want to broke her spirit. Uh, but, but she know, and she refused to tell them her name. We have a video for how we took a small part of, 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 the, of the torturing and the interrogation in her, uh, for her. And for the, the, what uh, my colleague said about the, the rights for the parents or for, for the family to be with their children in the interrogation or this law, we start to use the law in that way, but we don't believe that it's, it's a law because it's a punishment. When my wife went to the, uh, uh, police station to be with my my daughter, they arrest her also for for five uh, months. And when I I I went to the court to see to for the hearing, they detained me because I must be in jail also, and they give me took me to the, the to the to, to the police station to interrogation another time. And they release me in the same time. That's uh, they, I, I don't charge. I, don't, I haven't any charge in that in that time. Uh, my when every time I I, I I I I they took me to the court. I feel very worried for my my wife, my daughter, my family. Maybe they will be killed, it's like my my sister. I feel very worried about my daughter, my son when they in jail. Uh, in the interrogation system to face what I face. This is the, 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 the meaning of, 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 of how, how, how the life under occupation. Mm. But we believe our, our duty and responsibility is to resist. We can't keep silent under occupation. They can't broke our spirit to fight for our freedom and, and dignity. 
It's our responsibility and not our responsibility alone. It's your responsibility in everywhere in the place. We are the victim of the victim. We are the victim of your, 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 yani, your, your, your capitalist, capital, uh, the capitalism, the, the, the imperialism, the Israel is the guard for the interest of the colonization everywhere. It's not our, 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 our enemy. It's the enemy of humanity. Mm -hmm. For that, nobody can be free if I lose my freedom. And it's not a gift or a reward from the world. It's a duty and responsibility. We, we must have, have a, a, an international movement to end the occupation and end the colonization in our land. It's the mm -hmm. time the world must took their responsibility, like what's happening in, in South Africa, that the world stand up and said, uh, it's enough, but we don't see anything. Israel is over the, the law, over the international law, over everything. Uh, this is part of our life, daily life in under the Israeli occupation or in jail or in every, every home we have uh, their experience, their story. There is a lot of, of, of a very hard story more than my story but the time is short to talk about everything, but maybe I can indicate or show uh, how is the meaning of the occupation and the, 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 the prisoner system, the prison system in the colonization uh, regime. Mm. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and I'm ready for any question. I mean, it's an absolute honor and thank you for sharing your experience. I mean, you've almost, you've answered my question. I was going to ask in that, how do you keep going and with your experience and then to watch your children go through the same experience, but it's a responsibility. Um, I think you've answered that. It is a responsibility and it's ours. I might just looking at the time, move on to Yusuf um, and then we might come back and have some questions. Um, for everybody. Um, so I might now introduce you. can't be silent and the occupation also you, you must follow your belief. We must follow our belief. Absolutely. It's hard to, to keep up or uh, give up resisting the occupation. Occupation means resistance. If there is no resistance, the occupation have another meaning and it's an occupation. It's mean the resistance is, is, is the, the, the the only respond against this way, this life. It's the only, it's the absolute only answer. I think you can see that here in our First Nations activists who continue to struggle after 230 years of occupation. I mean, without a doubt. Thank you, Basim. Shukran Kathir. Um, I might um, bring up Yusuf now. And um, just before Yusuf jumps into it, I'm gonna just introduce him properly. So um, Yusuf Arimawi is a Palestinian lecturer in Arabic language and culture. He's a writer, a translator, a musician, a radio presenter, and a refugee activist. He's the founder and um, director of the Avaros Center for Arab Culture in, in Melbourne, the founder and director of Aspire, which is a collective for Palestinian refugees from the Iraqi and Syrian crisis. And he was also a founder of Australians for the Palestinian Prisoners. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Yusuf. Um, and I believe you have a presentation you're gonna share with us. Thank you, Melissa. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to start by uh, uh, saying thank you to uh, Free Palestine uh, Melbourne. Uh, particularly uh, Mu'ayyad, my friend Mu'ayyad, uh, for extending the idea of speaking uh, two months ago. And also to Michael, Melissa, and everyone in this wonderful emerging group. Um, also, I want to express how humble I am to speak after Nadia and uh, Basim. And I feel that uh, whatever we say here, Will, will, will be impossible to match the suffering and pain and knowledge and experience uh, of, of those who really live it. Um, 
I also want to uh, start by a small disclaimer that uh, while I had the uh, honor of representing Australia in an international conference on the Palestinian uh, prisoners that Algeria hosted uh, in December 2010, introduce myself or to uh, come across as an expert on this issue. Um, but what I'm going to do in my presentation is to uh, endeavor to take you uh, in a journey to learn about the uh, pain, the hopes, the uh, frustrations, the emotions of the families of the prisoners through translating authentic reflections of what they share on social media, particularly in the case here, Facebook. And um, so I will take you to Al-Quds, Al-Aisawiyah area, and we will go to uh, the house, the household that gave Palestine uh, two shaheeds, uh, two martyrs, and uh, nearly every member of the family as a prisoner, the household of Abu Samir, Um Samir al aisawi so if I may share the presentation uh, with you, uh, in my presentation, it's going to be screenshots of what they um, wrote in Arabic, and I will hi translate, translate the highlights. Bismillah. So, Um Samir al-Aisawi, and her daughter, Shireen. As you can see, she is carrying the pictures at the stage of her three sons and one daughter who were in uh, Israeli prisons. And I will, mom is calling me, so I will just close the Facebook. Okay. Um, Shireen, in the, on the occasion of her uh, arrest in 2014, remembers this uh, sad uh, and painful uh, memory. Uh, her arrest lasted for four years, most of which was in uh, solitary confinement. Shireen also gave a of the pain that Basim and Nadia spoke about of what it actually means to be a prisoner. In this post, uh, she talks about how her prison was raided by a group of soldiers and how she was violently beaten up by everyone and how they dragged her upstairs and downstairs and how they took her, uh, they put her in solitary confinement for uh, months, uh, including the month of Ramadan when she did not know uh, the exact time of breakfast, iftar Ramadan, and she didn't know uh, when it starts and ends. So she just in case fasted for 31 days because they deliberately inflict the pain of not knowing the surrounding around you and how she was denied uh, taking a shower for, for two months and how all her dreams back then was to just uh, uh, have uh, uh, know, know uh, the, the times for prayer and times for fasting. Um, Shirin also shared a picture with her brother Rafat uh, uh, on their way to a court that uh, Basim uh, described the pain of. Here, uh, Shirin uh, celebrates the release of one of her uh, sisters, uh, uh, prisoner Sabah Faraon, who uh, uh, stood up against the soldiers and tried to protect her when the head of the uh, prison um, tried to attack her. Um, and in this post, uh, Shireen is telling us about what it means to be a person uh, from Jerusalem. And uh, she starts by saying that they ask me why I'm always smiling. And the answer is very long, but I will try as a person from Al-Quds, like the majority of Palestinians in, in Al-Quds, we don't have Palestinian, Jordanian, nor Israeli passports. We just have travel documents. And also she talks about uh, the pain of, uh, of, of acquiring this, uh, this paper that you have to provide 150 uh, uh, pages of you know, uh, documents um, for, being, uh, for belonging to the wrong, pint, uh, uh, the wrong type of people being non-Jew. Uh, also uh, for failing, uh, because she served for four years in prison, 
she cannot get a police clearance and the police clearance is a prerequisite of employment. So they attack the prisoners even after their release with the, particularly the Palestinians of Jerusalem. So just a brilliant uh, post that talks that even us Palestinians uh, know very little about. And Shireen in this post starts another journey after getting married to a Palestinian refugee from Syria who fled the war in Greece, uh, Qais, uh, and uh, she and, and and that that itself is a chapter that is worth sharing later. In this one, Shireen uh, talks about a letter that she received from uh, uh, the uh, Damon uh, prison uh, of her uh, inmates, uh, thanking her for the time and pain that uh, she put uh, while teaching them Hebrew. And she feels that the most noble of emotions are the ones that are written, handwritten by a female prisoner. This is one of the most dear words that I have received. Now to Um Samer, to, the, to her mother, this is uh, Ramadan last year. Uh, uh, and the mother says, where are you mom? Uh, come and have breakfast with me. And I want to say that culturally, Palestinian mothers sometimes call their children mom. So mom, I, and I call mom mama, and she calls me mama because there's a case of inseparability between the mother and her uh, children. And uh, she says, where are you? Uh, come and have breakfast with me. This is during Ramadan, putting their picture. Uh, um Samer um, is telling us about her granddaughter, Layla, who was named after her. Layla uh, was not born. She, her mother was pregnant when her father Rafat was taken to prison and served eight months, eight years, eight years uh, prison. And she was telling that the innocence of children that she thought that if I uh, save my pocket money and I give my pocket money to the soldiers, they will uh, release my father and they allowed her to do that. Uh, but then the soldiers told her that, no, we can't release them. And then she, she, she learned the reality as she was four years old. And then she decided to donate her, uh, her pocket money uh, to a charity uh, a project in Jerusalem. Just like her father, Rafa, donates part of his uh, salary uh, to the other uh, prisoners. This is uh, a post from Shireen. Uh, and she, she talks, uh, she says, what a beautiful feeling when, when dad takes uh, sends you pictures of the end of the gate of your house in Jerusalem. You see also the bird's nest. I feel like I am with you in Jerusalem. I miss you, I love you. Shirin says that ever since 1989, when soldiers arrested my brothers, uh, we have not been reunited uh, in Ramadan or Eid. Since then we have been, we didn't have a whole family gathering since 1989. And here she commemorates her uncle to the right, who was killed in the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, 1982. His name is Osama al-Aisawi. And also she remembers her, her, her grandfather, Ahmad al-Aisawi, who was one of the leaders of the Palestinian civil resistance before Nakba. Um, at the beginning of the year, uh, Um Samer, the mother says, I pray to Allah uh, at, the, at the beginning of this year that this year will witness the clearing out of the Israeli presence of our prisoners and that our prisoners, our sons will go back to their families and their mothers, sisters, husbands, uh, wives and uh, loved ones uh, will, will, will feel happiness. Mother here says, uh, we, uh, we have spent our lives dreaming and we hope that Allah will make our dreams come true one day. Here the mother is celebrating the graduation of her imprisoned son uh, of a degree while he was studying and uh, Rafat uh, got the, uh, 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 a degree in uh, uh, education, uh, sociology education. Um, this is when Emirates and Bahrain signed the normalization deal in uh, September last year. And she said, it's okay, Palestine. You are the mother of all martyrs. You are, the mother of, you are the mother of all wounded. You are the mother of all prisoners. You are the mother of all honorable people. And you can embrace them and continue. I mean, it takes me, uh, uh, it takes a lot of uh, emotions and pain to even translate what they say. 
<clears throat> and here uh, she quoted a line from Ali Mahmoud Taha, the Egyptian uh, poet who wrote uh, a poem called uh, Palestine uh, upon the Nakba. Uh, one, the, the line uh, says, Palestine yahmi himak al-shababu fa'imma al-hayatu wa imma al-rada. O Palestine, you are guarded by the youth. So, so either dignified life or death. Uh, here, uh, the mother is uh, sharing uh, that uh, uh, she's happy that her, that Shireen has uh, given birth to a baby boy, and she feels that I wish I could be with you or you could be with us. And uh, here she said, our prisoners in uh, in a naqab in the desert in Nafha and Ramon in this very hot weather, how are you feeling? Oh, my heart is with you. Uh, the mother here is uh, sending us the picture of uh, uh, what Shireen uh, wrote uh, to dedicate his graduation master's degree of law. Uh, she recently, she, she, she last August uh, uh, 2020, she graduated the uh, master's degree of uh, law and she dedicated her thesis to uh, the prisoners and uh, her family members and of course the martyrs. Eid is coming again, but it has not knocked on my door. <clears throat> these, are, these are difficult stories, they're really difficult. Here, uh, she's celebrating the graduation from school of year, year 12 of her grandson, Tarek, who lost his eye. It's difficult to fathom. <clears throat> <clears throat> and here, Im Samer uh, says that uh, she's currently battling cancer. <clears throat> and she says that uh, my illness has no right to deprive me from writing about my uh, martyred son, Fadi, who was killed when he was a teenager after the Hebron massacre the Ibrahimi Mosque massacre in 1994. Um, here uh, on, the, uh, on the Palestinian Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian prisoners in April, uh, 17th of April, good morning, our prisoners. And she talks, she, she directs them and she, 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 she tells them how, uh, uh, what it means to be a uh, Palestinian on that special day for all Palestinians. And here uh, on the uh, birthday of uh, Ra'fat, Midhat, sorry, uh, when he was uh, serving eight year uh, prison, he, he, he was born in 1973 and he spent, he, so, so he's, he's one year older than me and he spent 27 years of his 47 years in Israel jail so and she is celebrating his uh, uh, birthday uh, uh, and um, when he was about to be released uh, there was an engagement party for uh, one of her uh, granddaughters uh, and then israel decided to just trade the house and ruin the engagement and try to and 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 uh, arrest uh, the father of the uh, bride to be. Um, I guess we. Uh, what I'm going to do is I will put uh, I will put this presentation online uh, after I provide the written uh, subtitles for uh, because uh, we still have uh, uh, more than twenty uh, more than twenty slides to go and my time has finished, but. Uh, uh, I want to say that you know having authentic access to what the uh, families of prisoners share with us their uh, their their emotions and their hopes and their despair and their happiness and their frustration 
it is it is itself a learning a learning uh, uh, journey for for me particularly but it's also worth sharing and i will leave you with um, a song uh, that has become the national anthem of all uh, prisoners this song was written uh, in 1922 by an anti french uh, poet uh, najib arrayes and it says, Ya Dalama Sijni Khayyim Inana Nahnu La Naqshat Dalama. All the darkness of prison descend upon us. We fear, we don't fear you. Um, one second, I'll just stop this and share this. This song was the introduction uh, song of uh, a soap opera, a series uh, that if time allows, we'll talk about it uh, later. But I'll leave you with a few seconds of this song. This has become the national anthem of prisoners, whether Palestinians or, 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 or Arabs. It was written by a Syrian, composed by Lebanese, and sung by all of us. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, again, I would like to thank uh, Free Palestine Melbourne and uh, to be uh, to reiterate uh, my gratitude to Bassam and Nadia for joining this panel. Thank you so much, Yusuf. I mean, it's quite a privilege for us to be able to access those stories. So um, thank you for taking the time to share us and offering to translate them so that we can have access to them because you're absolutely right. There's something quite special and different in being able to um, understand the pain from in someone's own language what they're what they're going through and I wonder that's my first question really to you is the impact of this system on the Palestinian psyche as you see it from your perspective um it's it's a it seems to be this incredible mix like it's a deeply painful deeply horrific thing to experience but yet there's this incredible dignity and incredible resilience and, and pride. Um, you know, when prisoners are released and brought home to their family, it's a huge celebration. Um, and so there, there's this, there's these two sides to this. And I think, it, I wonder if you might speak to that. Um, you're absolutely correct, uh, Melissa. Um, I remember when I first wrote on my Facebook that I will be speaking on this event, I received a message from one of my relatives uh, in Sweden who fled Syria because of the war. She is the wife of my maternal uncle and her name is Fadwa Abbas. And she herself is a daughter of a Shaheed from uh, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine who was uh, uh, killed in 1970. And she said, please tell your audience that uh, we uh, are very proud of the six uh, uh, freed, self-freed. <clears throat> I avoid to use the word escaping because they, 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 they made a decision to self-free themselves. And, and Fadwa is telling you, telling uh, our audience and telling all of us that uh, she asked me this Amana message and she said, tell them we are proud of our boys and we will continue to be proud until the rest of our lives. So uh, the, uh, this, the, the Palestinian prisoner issue is one of the uniting, uniting issues among all Palestinians where no political barriers are important, where, no, um, where no, uh, nothing else matters than uh, the freedom of our prisoners and also the pain that we know, as, as much as we know that uh, uh, the little and, and Basim took us in a journey and told us, uh, 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 the pain and what it means to be a prisoner and uh, uh, whether emotional or physical. 
so the whole Palestinian society is united behind this, uh, this cause, uh, the cause of Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. You are muted. It's a bad facilitator not to remember that. I wonder if we might bring Nadia and Bassem onto the camera and join the discussion. Um, if any of our audience that are watching, um, if they would like to ask questions, if any of you would like to ask questions of our panel, um, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. So if you could just type your questions into there. Um, and I think Bassem's gonna join us soon. Um, I wonder if we might, we, we sort of, everyone's talked about such interesting things and there's so much to talk about in this issue. Um, but I wonder if we might speak to specifically the prisoners that escaped um, and what, hap what happened when they escaped. Um, I, I wonder if each of you might share what it meant for you to see it personally, but also your observation broadly. Nadia? So um, I don't know if you hear, but you uh, today the the prisoners are going to be charged for breaking out uh, of prison, uh, which in, is in Israeli system is a criminal offense, and they can be sentenced for another seven years. And I just want to remind that uh, at the beginning, when they uh, freed themselves out, uh, Yusuf, you said freed themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Liberation. So, so uh, um, at the Israeli press, uh, all the time they talk about uh, uh, the streets and the possibilities that they can uh, commit um, a, a so called terror attack. Uh, and we can see now after the investigation and after what happened that the, what happened is just uh, that these prisoners want to be free uh, and uh, this is what, what happened. And the, this is one, uh, another um, way how Israeli try to dehumanize uh, these uh, this prisoners. Uh, they just want uh, all the time people to look at them like uh, monsters and the people that are, that we have uh, to be afraid to, uh, to meet. And, in this case, we can see that also the ISA uh, say that it was just, uh, uh, they tried just to, to escape in order to be free and not, and everything else don't happen. And what did it mean for you as a Palestinian to see this? Uh, you ask me? Mm. I was very proud to see what uh, they did. Uh, we talk about one of the most secure the prisons uh, in Israel that was built in during the second intifada and uh, they did the, the impossible. The impos a mission impossible was completed. <laughs> and, and Yusuf? Um, I want to, <clears throat> uh, we, one day we will say after years that we lived in the time of these six prisoners. And one day, one day our grandsons, we will say that our grandfathers, six of them, among, among remembering all of this, but this will stand out as a turning point. I mean, today we are singing We know the names of Muhammad Jamjoum, Fuad Hjazi, Atazir, the three Palestinians, who fought the, the British mandate in the 29 and 30, and then they were taken to the Akka prison, and then they were executed, and then they were immort their story was immortalized by a, po a, a poet who wrote uh, who, this beautiful song. And then in the 70s and the 60s, when there was a music band who uh, uh, became the band of the Palestinian revolution, the Al-Ashikin band, composed it and then all of the Palestinians now sing this 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 the, the, the story of these three heroic Palestinians in 90 who were executed in the 30s so this is a turning point and it will become it will be immortalized in our um, in our uh, history books and also 
as Nadia said, uh, that they are currently, as we speak, they are being, uh, uh, they are in the court and they will be, there will be a ruling against them. Captivated our imagination is that when there was a net or, or, or video conferencing, for the first time, the six prisoners saw each other. And what, they did, what did they do? They, they exchanged the victory sign. So that became a news item <laughs> that the Palestinians, the six Palestinian prisoners are exchanging the victory sign. And so, so what I'm telling you that uh, uh, this, this, is, this has become the center of all Palestinians and not just Palestinians, the Arabs and all pro-Palestinians who really have a spot in their hearts for Palestine this is unbelievable. I mean, I received, I, I might show you later a message uh, of, of an Iraqi uh, friend of mine who lives in Melbourne. And she said in English, and she said, the story of the six Palestinian prisoners has made me feel that I wish I was Palestinian. <laughs> yes. she said, I, I, I wish, I, could, I, I, wish I, I was one of the Palestinian people. So there is, we, we, we can talk for hours about what it meant for, for, for us. I, I wonder though, it also had an impact on those that were in prison at the time. Um, and I wonder what the impact, I mean, there would have been a psychological impact of course, uh, but also the, imp the reaction of the Israeli system and what happened to the prison conditions when these prisoners escaped. Um, we, we saw how the soldiers and the guards have unleashed their frustration and anger against all Palestinian prisoners the moment the news of the self-liberation uh, was, was made. And there was, uh, 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 for, for three or four or five days, there was cycles of, anti, of, of violence and brutality uh, against them. And also there was uh, a, a spirit of more uh, resistance and resilience among the Palestinian prisoners. So it was, it, it had a direct and immediate impact on, uh, on the Palestinian prisoners. And uh, I'm sure Nadia and Basim can say more about this. Have we got, um, Nadia, are you back? Yeah, I'm here. Oh yeah, you must have frozen for a minute. Um, are you able to also speak to the impact on the conditions for the prisoners? So at the beginning, uh, I remember that they, uh, from many uh, prisoners, we know that uh, the prison, from many prisoners in many prisons, uh, we know that uh, they were kept in uh, very bad conditions. Uh, they restrict um, very much their condition. They cannot get out uh, from their uh, cells uh, all the day, uh, just uh, an hour uh, to be outside, uh, when at normal time they can be outside for eight hours. Uh, there were no vis uh, family visits uh, all these uh, months, uh, just uh, uh, recently they uh, returned to visit. Uh, but what happened that uh, the prisoners uh, uh, decide to uh, uh, to get into a large strike uh, in order to uh, get back their condition. And uh, in the IPS, I think, uh, was afraid to have another, uh, another problem. Uh, have, he has uh, enough problem after the, the escape. So uh, they, uh, all the things, I think, now return to be uh, the same as the uh, for uh, the 6th of September. Um, but I can say that now uh, all these prisoners, uh, the six prisoners, will be kept in very, very uh, bad conditions. They will be in isolation for a long time. They will not be allowed to get vis a family visit. Uh, and they, uh, all the time, uh, they want to get out uh, of the cell, they will be kept with, them, uh, with the chain. Uh, uh, and this happened to any prisoner that tried to, uh, to escape from the... I wonder... Um, the oh. I wonder if I might change track a little bit and just talk about a slightly different topic that we haven't covered. Um, 
And that is a prisoner exchanges. I mean, you, you actually, actually, you did touch on it, Nadia, very briefly, and to talk about that Palestinian citizen with Israeli citizenship don't come into the equation when it, we talk about prisoner exchanges. Um, but I know following uh, the May um, uprising and the assault on Gaza, there was a lot of talk on social media around the possibility of a prisoner swap happening. Um, and even recently still Hamas are releasing um, pictures of the Israeli soldiers that they've got um, in custody there. And I wonder if you might speak to that and, and what's, going, what's going on there, what the significance of this is, if anything. Um, and also, I mean, these Israeli soldiers, they're not, they're not white Israelis. And I wonder if you might comment on, on, on what that, that factor. Um, Yusuf, maybe a question for you, that one. Um, that's a very important uh, topic to touch on. Uh, the history of prisoner swap with Israel uh, basically started uh, a few weeks after the birth of this rogue state of Israel. Uh, the first swap was in 48 uh, between uh, Israel on one hand and uh, Egypt and Jordan on the other hand, where they exchanged, uh, they exchanged uh, uh, prisoners. The second one was in 1954 also, uh, where uh, there was 10 of the Egyptian Navy. Um, uh, so between Egypt and Israel, another one uh, also between uh, Syrians and Israel in 1954 and 57. Uh, but also the, one, one, one of the biggest uh, historic uh, uh, swap between the Palestinians uh, and um, Israel, when PLO exchanged uh, more than uh, uh, 1,200 Palestinian prisoners uh, upon the invasion of uh, uh, when they when they managed to, uh, to 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 arrest some of the Israeli soldiers. So, of course, uh, the last the last prisoner swap we had is what we call the Shalit uh, deal uh, when uh, Israel. Uh, uh, freed uh, hundreds or more than a thousand Palestinian freed prisoners in, in, in a deal that they broke they, they broke themselves. So mm -hmm. how many how many how many uh, prisoners who were part of the deal they were rearrested again? I know, for example, Samer. We spoke about Um Samer. Samer was Samer Laisawi, a, 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 a prisoner from uh, Al Quds, who was uh, freed in the Shalit deal, but he was rearrested again mm -hmm. because Israel just. You know, they, they do it because they can. I mean, uh, the whole world knows the name of the, uh, uh, of, 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 uh, the, of, of, of the Israeli uh, soldier who was in uniform with guns in somebody else's land, uh, trying to make our life more painful. But nevertheless, they, Israel presented this prisoner as, you know, uh, uh, an, an innocent person, but very few of us and the world knows the names of Palestinian prisoners. And that takes me to an important point where we should address the issue of prisoners, not as numbers or figures only. Figures and numbers are important. Statistics are important. We should, we should use all that, but also as names, faces, stories, and names of their family members. Um, so now back to your question. I think uh, we are hope we are hoping that there will be another uh, wave of Palestinian prisoners freed uh, uh, with with Hamas uh, before the end of the year, uh, or maybe early next year, depending on uh, the negotiations between the two sides. But also, you touched on the fact that uh, these prisoners were not from the favorite mainstream. Uh, typical white uh, 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 Israeli Jews, so that this this is why they are, you know the, the deal has taken more than eight years. Probably, if they were uh, if they were uh, more uh, belonging to the mainstream Israelis, they it, it wouldn't have taken that long. But I'm not going to commentate more on this because racism in Israel. I mean, Israel was founded on racism. It's not just against the Palestinians. It's also against the, 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 the Eastern Jews, the Russian Jews, the Falasha Jews. Uh, and, uh, so, so, and, and, and who speaks about that? Israelis themselves, not us. Nadia, do you have things you want to add to what Yusuf just shared? I think uh, 
is I agree with the author. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, th I think this this, pr this recent prison prisoner swap that's being discussed is interesting because it helps you understand the broader scheme when you think about how long it's taken and, and you know, who are these Israeli soldiers that they're trying to get back. It, it, it does help you understand the bigger, the bigger structure. Um, I wonder, I mean, we've hit, we've hit 9.30, which was our end time. We might, um, I think we can ask a few more questions. We seem to have lost Basim. I don't know if he can hear me and can unmute himself and join the conversation. I'm not sure. Um, I would like to include him in this conversation. Um, I wonder, these arrests of Palestinians, they also seem to very specifically target Palestinians engaged in, in resistance. Um, to the occupation as a way of, I don't know, it's a way of trying to stop the resistance. I think we're just going to get Basim back. I saw his mute come off. Um, uh, does it demoralise Palestinians or, or does it just make Palestinians more determined? What's your experience of your clients, Nadia? I think it makes them more determined. It's uh, it's not a, it's occupation. It's not a thing that you face just in many occasions. It's something that you live with. It's something that uh, is with you in everything in your life. Uh, when you go to school, to the university, to your work, when you go to to your field, uh, also. If you are, uh, I don't know, if you work at your field and you want your donkey to pass the the the, the wall, uh, and uh, the soldier asks for a permit for your donkey, you know, you can find the, you can find the, the occupation in everything. So I think that uh, uh, no matter what happened, uh, Palestinian continue to resist uh, to the occupation is not. Uh, is a thing that the IHL, uh, the international humanitarian law, uh, know and uh, talk about. It's not something new. And uh, uh, however, Israeli uh, press try to uh, to make this a criminal a criminal thing. I think uh, uh, we uh, it's very important to uh, to remember. Uh, where the things begin and uh, and to to see all the uh, how to say uh, all the um sura kamli uh, yusuf <laughs> panoramic picture oh, yes the panoramic picture and in order to see all the the side of the story uh, so i think yes the palestinian will continue to resist uh, the the occupation not because uh, not just because they are determined but also because the occupation makes them do this but it must be said Yusuf that it's had a very real impact on on leadership of the Palestinian struggle surely um you know one of the leading candidates to in the in the election that just didn't happen he, he's um Baguthi is is imprisoned. Um, I wonder if you might speak to that impact, though. Well, we have the leader of the the Palestinian uh, uh, the PFLP, Ahmed Saadat, uh, is 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 in prison. We had Marwan Barghouti, one of the leaders of the Fatah movement, uh, in prison. We had uh, um, uh, Jarrar. Uh, who also is from uh, PFLP. We had leaders from DFLP. We also had leaders from Hamas, including the, the, the members of parliament. Abdel Aziz Dweik was uh, at, at, at a stage in prison. So uh, like you said in the introduction, Israel targets the, 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 whether the political leadership, but also the intellectual leadership and the civil society movement uh, leadership on, on purpose, because these people can bring about change. Uh, so I, I guess now that uh, Basim has uh, joined us, I think he can elaborate uh, more. Have we got Basim? No, I think. Basim. Hello, hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello. I wonder if you might speak to that question as well and the, the impact on the way Israel targets um, leaders and resistors and, and the political um, class of, of Palestine. 
تاثير تاثير اعتقال اسرائيل للقيادات الفلسطينيه السياسيه والثقافيه والنخبه الفلسطينيه بشكل عام يو نو ذي فوكس اون ذا ليدرز اند ذا ليدرز اوف ون ذا ذا اكتيفيست اند ذا جورناليست ذا اول 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 ذا 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 لوير ذا فيرست انتفاضه اي اول ذا ذا ليدر اند ذا اكتيفيست اند ذا 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 دكتور اوف ذا يونيفرسيتي ذا اول اوف ذيز journalists are being in jail because they know that when they they want to arrest the leaders and the unified leadership or the first intifada they arrest them many times to stop the intifada and all the time the Palestinian has uh, another uh, يعني, leaders who will be on the same place to replace the, the who will be arrested. Uh, but also they use it in a bad situation. When they arrest the, some leaders, they focus or uh, to, to get يعني, they they arrest for 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 example when they arrest or kill the 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 more active or the radical leaders to bring to on the on the stage the leaders who can accept some I think we're having trouble with your internet political agreement so in, in this way they want to put inside uh, some leaders uh, to, to emit sometimes uh, when they kill Abu Jihad they want to uh, to stop the intifada growing up and the clash is growing up they want to to make the leaders more, more, more sadiq. But I want to say that we want to hide some of the groups that are more radical and more radical. So they, they, they particularly try to neutralize the leaders who are more influential, more, more, more known of their steadfast and firm uh, position. So they, they particularly targeted Khalil al-Wazir, for example, Abu Jihad, to, <laughs> because he was a spearhead of the Palestinian first intifada. I wonder, that leads me into another question. I think it was quite interesting. Um, you know, Israel is, they engage in extrajudicial killings of Palestinians all the time. Um, you know, we, we hear stories daily out of Palestine, multiple stories a day at the moment, it seems, of people going about their business and being killed. Um, you know, a, a, a gentleman on the border with Gaza hunting birds and he gets killed, the woman in Jerusalem just recently. Um, it, it's it's a, so common and yet these six escapees are arrested, they're not killed, and they're among the most dangerous prisoners, um, according to Israel. And so I wonder if you might talk about that tactic, um, Nadia or Yusuf, if you either of you want to answer that question, that, that you know, it's, a, it's clearly a system. When they want to, they can use lethal force, and when they want to, they don't. I, I think, I feel like that's sort of a little bit what you're talking about there, Yusuf, with the the way that they target, the way they use these. Um... Mm. Um, that's a very interesting point you raised, uh, Melissa. I agree with you that uh, in Israel, nothing happens because you know the circumstances uh, have come up this way. There is a systematic extrajudicial executions. I mean, when uh, when when it happens, the soldiers. Uh, it, it, let's assume that the soldiers who, who, who perform the executions don't have the green light from their leadership. How many soldiers who killed Palestinians extrajudicially were brought to justice? In Israeli courts, not international law, not to the high court, uh, their own law. How many of them, it, 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 with a few exceptions of the very blatant one that you know, um, you cannot even uh, uh, convince your own audience inside Israel, then they put it in a mild form of imprisonment or some form of home arrest. 
but all of them, they get away with it. So nothing is uh, random, it's, it's systematic and they do it on purpose. And uh, it will unfortunately continue to happen if the international community does not interfere. And I want to stress the importance of international solidarity. One of the things that we can do here in Australia. Oh no, we lost Yusuf. This is, this is uh, to, to highlight the issue of the imprisonment of Palestinian children, uh, because uh, arresting children is an issue of agreement. And we saw what uh, the Israeli lobby in Australia, how they responded to the ABC documentary uh, two or three years ago on the imprisonment of Palestinian children. There was an, a huge, huge outcry uh, uh, among the Israeli uh, lobby in Australia because it touched on a very serious nerve. This is an issue of agreement among all uh, 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 around the world. So I, I want to invite experts in, uh, in, in legal uh, areas and in, in international law to... Hopefully, and hopefully, and hopefully to prevent Israeli diplomats from entering Australia. Mm. And I think on that note, that's an action point for us um, on what we can do. And so I might wrap it up, Nadia, with a final question to you. Where do you get hope? How do you keep going? Where do you get hope? Excuse me, I didn't hear this. Where do you, it's a final question for you. Where, where does your hope come from? Um, how do you keep going day to day in a system that I can't imagine you win many cases? Okay, you asked me a very difficult question. Uh, it will be strange if I say that every time I visit uh, prisoners in the jail, uh, I I feel I feel how how we have to be uh, how to say I get my hope from these people they are uh, held in very difficult conditions and uh, and they keep going and they keep uh, uh, talk with you like uh, how to say they are full of life and hope and I say to myself, anytime I, I go out from the prison, I say, okay, these people, they do a very, a very important thing in resisting the occupation. And I think, uh, I think they know why they, they are uh, in the jail and they know why they have to pay this uh, uh, price. Uh, so maybe for this thing, they, they feel they are strong enough and uh, can give you hope all the time. So I, I say to myself, okay, I have to keep going and to keep uh, trying to do my better in order to, to help uh, my people. At the end, I don't, uh, I don't do these things for another people, I do for myself and for my people. And so I think this is the, the <laughs> the most things that empower me. And I, th I think that might, be, um, oh, that might be the note on which we leave this forum. I mean, it's a difficult thing to talk about um, prison and, and, and hope, but if as long as there is resistance, then we owe it to keep showing up, to keep fighting and to keep um, creating the space for these conversations to spread the awareness, to challenge our governments, to stand up to our governments and to hold Israel accountable for this, um, this system and eventually Palestinian freedom. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us. Um, thank you very much, Nadia. Thank you very much, Yusuf. And Bassem, I'm not sure if we've still got him on the call, but thank you so much. Shukran Katir. Thank you everyone else for joining us. Um, we've run a little bit over time, but I hope um, it's been an interesting and worthwhile discussion for everyone. Thank you, Melissa, and for uh, your group. You're doing a wonderful work. And also, I want to thank Basim and Nadia for joining, for being part of the uh, panel with them. Thank you all. I was very excited to participate in this webinar. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Basim, too.